later, though. we got a lot of pilots here. I, uh, I don't remember anything about that. The only thing that I can ever remember... Can you hear me back? Yeah. The only thing I can ever remember wanting to be when I grew up was a, uh, a pilot. Uh, as I said earlier in the little talk we had, uh, I'm sure part of it came from watching the war movies back in uh, the Second World War. Read about that. I'm sure in history books, hopefully. Oh, uh, and as I was looking around here, I look at the miles and I remember a story. Every little, back in those days, it wasn't miles like this. There would be a book that would come out. In the local uh, liquor store where I lived in uh, Venice, California. You don't the liquor store? especially flying single engine fighter planes, you are responsible for whether you live or die, whether you performed well, didn't perform, people were counting on you. Uh, and when I was flying in Korea, for example, I can remember time and time again, I'm flying and I'd fly over maybe some ground troops down there in Korea, and I often had that thought, I don't know if I could handle that. With it. I mean, I really didn't know, but as long as I was in that airplane, I felt like I could handle anything. <laughs> 
Well, you reminded me, do you remember uh, wing cigarettes? Yes, yes. And yes. they, I didn't smoke at that age, never smoked, but you, they had little cards in them mm -hmm. with airplanes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Remember that? I mean, I've collected so many of those. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'd go buy them out of the cigarette. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and just add a little bit of what Walt said. The, uh, I didn't grow up thinking about being a pilot. Appreciated what was going on in the air, and partly because the, my hometown in southern New Mexico, Silver City, was on a, uh, a major flyway, uh, military flyway, and during World War II and the Korean War, there were a vast number of airplanes that would fly over. And I got, and that's how I learned how to identify airplanes was watching these yeah. fleets go over. And I do re remember that uh, my dad had been a Marine in uh, World War One. And he was the equivalent of a fighter pilot by being in the Marine Cavalry. <laughs> yeah. the, uh, but uh, uh, in, uh, one day uh, in the 50s, we uh, all of a sudden these uh, formation after formation of uh, C 119s, so called boxcar, uh, or flying boxcar, were going over, headed west. And my dad uh, and I were watching those, and he said something's going to happen. Well, this was, of course, in the Korean War. And about two weeks later, the uh, Marines went into Incheon. And uh, I don't know whether anybody else figured that <coughs> out, <laughs> but it was pretty obvious something was going to happen. As far as I went into Korea in Incheon. You did? Every year, you're supposed to get to fly over cities, a DC-4 yeah. or something like that. Yeah. And it was some master sergeant that they really needed there to hurt. They put him on the DC-4, sent me down to San Diego, and I had to be a, uh, a platoon leader for a month at sea and landed in Incheon. I didn't know a thing about ground trips. But I <laughs> oh, <laughs> That's how I got to Korea. I landed in Incheon, too. You learn something every day. Not <laughs> one. <laughs> the, uh, my, my training uh, really began when I decided to volunteer for the Scientist Astronaut Program. Uh, Deke Slayton had insisted with, with the NASA management that everybody coming into the Apollo Program had to qualify as a pilot. And there, was, there were uh, six of us selected in the first scientist group, and that was group four of the astronauts. Uh, two had already had pilot training. Bill Kerwin uh, was a Navy flight surgeon who had just completed carrier ball. Selected. Uh, uh, Kurt Michael had flown F 86s in Korea with the Air Force. And so those two were pulled out and, and, re, and, and recertified in the T 38 uh, Talon. The, uh, the, uh, the rest of us were sent off to uh, pilot training with the Air Force at Williams Air Force Base. And, and that training began with uh, Cessna 172s. Uh, it was the first year that the Air Force went back to tra training uh, jet pilots in propeller airplanes first. Uh, why did they do that? Well, they were trying to save money. It was a lot cheaper to wash people out in a Cessna 172 than it was to wash them out in a, in a T-37, a twin jet Cessna. And uh, by about a factor of five or six, I think, something like that. And so uh, we, we started uh, with 30 hours of 172. In uh, 90 hours in the T-37 from Jet Cessna, which converted jet fuel to noise. <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> Did you ever fly a T-37? Never. Uh, you ever get close to one? You can still hear it. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, and then uh, 120 hours in the T-38s. <clears throat> and that put us in the same uh, flying category, at least, as the other NASA astronauts. Well, they had their wings. Yeah, they, they were turned loose just like everybody else. You know, that, that's the nice thing about once you qualify as a pilot, you go out there and as Wallace said, you're responsible. You're responsible for the airplane, you're responsible for yourself. And in fact, Deep Slayton used to uh, defend having these airplanes or and us flying yeah. the airplanes by saying it's our only psychological trainer. Everything else we did, you make a mistake, you reset it, you try again. And the T-38, you make a mistake, you don't get to reset it. You've got to figure out how to get out of it. And uh, again, that builds that sense of responsibility 
which is a unifier, I think, among all the people that yes. were astronauts in those days. I think so, too. That's what I got my wings in, right there. The F-6 head up there. Shot down more enemy aircraft than any other airplane in the Second World War. Huh? I used to, in the, we'd go out there to that airplane, and I could see through the blue paint, I could see the Japanese flags. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the Corsair? Yeah. Is that a Corsair? Well, the Corsair is here. Yeah. Okay, Did you fly? That's the F-6 head. Yeah, but I mean... No, no, no. That's no. probably one of my biggest disappointments. Hell of a That's what I hear. Anyway, we're reminiscing. Uh, <laughs> somebody asked Dr. Atkin or Dr. Jurist, do you want to make a, just a general comment about? Well, I'm, I'm real curious as to how uh, uh, your attitudes changed about military aviation wall uh, as you went through the process and then became an uh, involved flight test and then segue into an astronaut. How do you see that uh, changing <coughs> for you, and then how would you see it changing in the future? Uh, military aviation, uh, for flying, there was no difference. I mean, when you get your pilot trainings, uh, you're expected to perform, well, you might get killed, or you might wipe out somehow, but it, it, in essence, you're expected to be able to handle that. My uh, suggestion to anybody is you make, you keep challenging yourself a little bit so you become proficient at it. But when I went to NASA, uh, <coughs> I was just transferring from uh, A4Ds at the time where I was flying the reserves, but I transferred also to the Navy Reserve Squadron up at uh, uh, Dallas. And uh, uh, so I got to check out in the FJ4 Bakers, and then we got the F8Us, Crusaders. Uh, but almost all of my flying was uh, at uh, NASA. I probably, over the whole eight years that I was at NASA, uh, I figured out one time that I, I averaged about 32 to 34 hours a month for the whole time I was there on the number T-38s. Times have changed. We had a lot of T-38s. For a while, there were 30 pilots and 30 T-38s. Uh, and we, basically, all of our flying all of our business we conducted in that. I think the whole eight years I was there, I may have flown commercial three, four times, something like that. And one time I remember it's because I had to ground my T-38. The only time in eight years I had to ground T-38 in room. Great maintenance. We had just super. Yes. Terrific airplane that also. And I'm still, still out there. A lot of people still flying T-38s in the world. <coughs> but that's changed. The whole world has changed. You're growing up in a different world when it comes to flying. I was out about a year ago at uh, NASA for something out at the, at the Ellington Field, and I signed stuff by NASA. And I went down to the hangar, went in, the guy was, said hello to me, he was going to see me, show me around. He was, he, he was going to be leaving NASA a couple months himself. So I went out and looked at the, at the T-38s. They're more modern airplanes. Uh, they relieved the pilot of more things to do. For example, it even had small weather radar in it, uh, autopilot. I never had an autopilot my entire life. Uh, but what really got to me was the pilots were all limited to 15 hours a month, maximum, if you were on a flight crew. Otherwise, it was 12 hours a month. And uh, with the uh, mission specialists who they checked out to the, the backseat riders in it, if you had somebody like that with you, you could, uh, well, you couldn't fly if you had worked, if you'd worked 12 hours doing something else, say, limited that. So it was basically placing a limitation on you. If you had a, a mission specialist who was a qualified backseat guy there, then they might let you take one flight on it. Uh, you had to fly, uh, you had to do your flight planning to arrive at your alternate destination. How many people are here into you know, knowing flying your main destination and alternate? Anything about instrument flying? Things like that. They had to plan, not necessarily arrive, they had to plan on having a thousand pounds of fuel left when they got to the alternate. When now, they got there. When they got to the alternate. For planning purposes. Ah! Now, you took off T-38, you're fortunate if you got airborne with 3,000 pounds of fuel in it. I'm just going to give you an idea of the difference, because you're living with a difference. You're living in a new world of flying. It's one that I don't, 
I can't even say I understand all that well. Back in those days, if you want to read my book, The All American Boys, I tell about one of these trips. We used to take off, and this is what I'm talking about, the personal challenge. We take off from Los Angeles, and it was, uh, I think, the 1,285 nautical miles from there to Houston. And if it was the right time of the year, you started to get a tailwind up there, and you could plan on getting maybe uh, getting up to average 60 knots for the entire way, we calculated you could make it nonstop. So, at about 40,000. Well, we start off 41, then 43, then 45. Yeah. yeah. And then we shut down an engine. <laughs> yeah. We shut down an engine. Uh, go back to Iowa for the last hundred and some miles. But what I'm getting at is we like the personal challenge. Nobody ever got killed doing it. But there's not an Air Force instructor I ever saw that ever believed we could fly nonstop from Los Angeles to Houston. But I guarantee you that we got something out of it when we did it. It was a satisfaction. i never forget the one I write about in the book, you'll appreciate this one, is uh, uh, I was in the back seat and Wally was in the front. Uh, Wally Sharaf again. Yeah, Wally Sharaf. He was our commander on, on our flight. We did a lot of flying together. And you usually trade seats. One guy flies one way, leg, and the other guy flies the next leg. But Wally was scheduled to come back. Uh, to fly that late, and I'm in the back seat, and I'm sitting with my E6B computer. Slide room, circular slide room. You know what they are. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you, you, <laughs> I know he does. You've got one sitting right, right next to you up there. <laughs> okay. So, I'm sitting here with my... Oh, about that. So, I'm sitting here with my E6B. That won't fit in my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and you take off, you take off from there. And instead of making a bird climb, as soon as you get airborne, out of burner. Uh, and doing everything you can to conserve fuel, climbing on up, trying to get to uh, 41,000 feet, and heading out to the east, and, and you know, trying to get to the point where you're averaging. We figured out you had to average at least 60 knots the entire way. Tailwind. And your tailwind, yes, the jet stream. You catch the jet stream just right at certain times of the year. And I can remember we crossed the. Uh, What's the river, the Colorado River, we cross the Colorado River, and I, I tell Wally, I say, well, we're getting about 30 knots of tailwind, and, and uh, you filed for our, uh, El Paso, because El Paso is only 600 nautical miles, so you filed for El Paso, before you get to El Paso, we started picking up things a little bit, it still wasn't good enough, so I refiled for uh, Austin, you know, the, is that the thing? Kelly. No, Kelly. No, no, uh, no, whatever. It's, no, 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 Austin. Yeah, it's now, it's now their uh, commercial fields. We filed for there and started looking like, well, we might going to be making this. So we did eventually refile for, uh, El, uh, excuse me, Ellington. Ellington's there where we flew out of. And the weather was clear, so we didn't have to worry about any weather. And we're letting down, and, and uh, we pulled back to Idle, right, right there about Bergstrom Air Force Base, pulled in, back to Idle. And Wally and I are talking it all over, and we're down to about 30,000 feet. And Wally says, why don't we shut an engine down? And I said, yeah, I think we better shut an engine down. <laughs> so we shut one engine down. That probably saved 30 pounds of fuel. And we're coming in, and we're really, really cautious because we knew how close it was. So we're almost over Ellington, and the tower operators, that's what they kind of knew when we were doing this. But, uh, <laughs> we it, and they were mostly helpful to us. And... Uh, we always try to get a straight in approach, save fuel, of course. So as we're coming in, and I look, and it looks a little high to me, and while he's being so safe, that we end up actually crossed over the end of the runway, 5,000 feet, you know, one engine. That's <laughs> pretty <laughs> idle. 5,000 feet, and Wally has to make a, 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 one, uh, a 360 from there down. And so I'm sitting in the back seat and saying, well, just in case. It's the only time in my life I found myself sitting there and holding on to both <laughs> ejection <laughs> ejects and handle. And the boy who's a fine aviator. It's so coming in really steep when we touch down. Normally. Nobody ever knows what the kind of problem was. But we had great satisfaction out of doing it. Now, the refuelers knew. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes they had to put a couple pounds in more than that. 
and they thought, <laughs> he's not going to like me uh, telling you this kind of story. Okay? <laughs> That's a fact. <laughs> <laughs> if you're an astronaut, go ahead. That's why I'm doing it. <laughs> all I'm doing is, is telling you that in the military, especially in those days, your job was to feel as proficient as you can. Whether you were right or wrong about it, you wanted to think you were the best band aviator there was around there. So that's not something that's open to you, and you're never going to get to have this kind of opportunity. It was like a flying club to us back in those days, you know, 30 airplanes, 30 pilots, hell, you couldn't, you couldn't ever ask for anything any better. But what I'm trying to say is push yourself, not to those kind of limits necessarily, but push yourself to some limits. Test yourself when you're doing it. You know, uh, don't look for, uh, when you get your instrument ready, don't try to find nothing but the best weather out there to do your flight. Go get the experience at some weather when it's not bad and you, you develop the confidence. When you have the self-confidence, you can go out and do almost anything you want to in those areas. You always need instrument time, so go find some Right. Weather. And uh, there is a, a similar situation of trying to get from Ellington to end. If you got about 80 knots on the tail, you could do that and still maintain an all, a legitimate all. Yeah, but Andrews is in Washington, D.C., <coughs> and they have got all kinds of nonsensical <laughs> yeah. control. Uh, yeah, you have, you have to do something. What, uh, in not doing what Walt just described, uh, coming back from L.A. one time, I had refueled in, uh, in El Paso. I had a great refueling operation. Uh, Ernie Venezuela. Who? Venezuela? Yeah, yeah. yeah remember yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. He came, yeah. What's it in with him? Yeah, and he came over to Silver City to say hello oh, when I came back from my post flight visit. Anyway, be that as it uh, I took off, and there was a huge thunderstorm right over uh, Houston, over Hobby Airport. And uh, so I couldn't really let down. So I, it was late at night. You, well, very often we're coming back from a, some kind of meeting late at night, and there wasn't much traffic, so I taught, I asked uh, approach control if I could maintain altitude until I was over Ellington. Now, who knows how I got out to Ellington? Two split S's. <laughs> <laughs> and it was perfect. It's nice to came, came, came right. <laughs> but the thing you had to remember, as a consequence of a previous accident, uh, with a goose hitting a cockpit, we had thick windscreens, remember that? And so if you were going to bring that airplane down very fast, you had to turn up the heat on those windscreens. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, in the Houston atmosphere, all of a sudden, your Why? vision disappeared. So I had, as soon as I figured out what I was going to do, I had that thing cranked up. And I'll tell you, it wasn't very pleasant. It was hot in that cockpit. A lot more pleasant than not being able to see the window. Mm -hmm. Again, it's a, you, you push yourself, you test yourself, but you you always sort of have a backup plan. That's exactly the right. Well, like they, he mentioned it, he, they were continually revising their their plan to uh, by airport, by airport, by airport, as related to their fuel supply. So you, you do that in the back of your mind all the time. Let me turn some of the questions towards space travel, Dr. Acton. I'd like to maybe have you answer this to start. What well, well, what surprised you about being in space? What was particularly interesting about it? I got some other comments first. Oh, please, please. You had to put up with people like us. Um, <laughs> you have seen the prime requirement to get pilot. Namely, you've got to be able to tell yarns and stories. So uh, that's one of, the, one of the clear requirements. You notice neither one of us put our hands up. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you could. <laughs> Uh, I was raised on a ranch in the Snowy Mountain, south of Lewistown. And when I was a kid, the air traffic was so seldom in that country that when an airplane would come over, we'd go outside and see it. It was really crazy. My first ride was in the Piper Cup with my brother who just got back from World War II and got his pilot's license on the GI Bill. Uh, there is life when you aren't able to be a pilot. I've got amblyopia, I can only see very well out of one eye, and that one's colorblind. Uh, so clearly I couldn't have done any of this stuff. But if you become a scientist, they don't give you physical exam to be a scientist. So all you got to do is 
crash courses and have a vision for curiosity about how the world works. Now, I think Parliament is one of the best examples of putting together human dexterity, human mind, and a sophisticated machine with clear outcomes of done work. And so that's, that's really good training. And putting together your mind and your body and your training to do a worthwhile thing, whether it's in science, whether it's on the shuttle, which I got to fly on Challenger. Uh, boy, oh boy, it's great. But it's good to have a fallback. You know, sometimes things don't work out the way you like. And uh, I always told my kids, learn how to type. And uh, both of them thank me for it. So anyway, there is life without being able to pilot an airplane. And you might even get into space if you're lucky. Uh, but I think probably there's a different kind of satisfaction in controlling an airplane. Now, I don't know if I particularly want to be a pilot in, in the modern airline business where computers and the controllers and everybody sort of keeps you from doing the kind of personal involvement that uh, Walt's talking about. But by golly, more power to you. Carry out your dreams. This is a good example of what you just <coughs> mentioned there about being able to back things up. In the modern airplanes and the screens up there with all the, the instruments on it and all of that, it's slow for me to kind of get used to that because I'm used to the others. When you've got your gauges, you've got to have a backup on there because if, if your electronics go out, you still got to be able to fly an airplane. My personal recommendation is that when you're out there flying and you get a chance, if there's somebody else with you especially, go ahead and use those instruments. Find some way of, I don't know how they do it now, but you can block off that and just fly with your gauges because they're going to be there. Uh, needle ball, air, airspeed. And read accident reports. <laughs> that Air France thing that went down in the Atlantic Ocean was because the pitot tubes got frozen over. No. Um, yeah. You no. tell me about it. I'll tell you what happened. <laughs> we had a generation of aviators who didn't know how to handle things. That should not have been an accident. Period. It's because they didn't know how to handle uh, when they had no uh, airspeed indicator on it. And if they had angle of attack indicators, they had all kinds of things. RPM. That should never have been an accident. But you had incompetent pilots sitting there doing it. And incompetent because that was the airline's decision on how they trained. That's right. So, well, tell, tell them, what you, you told me a story today about the kind of the airplane that you initially flew in weather and the kind of instrumentation you had and everything after that was was an improvement. Made it easier. Yeah. It's and what I credit I credited my entire flying career, which was about twenty five years long. I credit it all to being essentially pretty doggone easy because of the first squadron I went into. Uh, as a military fighter pilot in the Marine Corps. There for five or six months and then transferred overseas to flying the first flying night fighter. Jet <coughs> night fighter in Korea. It was after they'd already had a kind of armistice, so we had a mission, but we never did really see any airplanes the whole time we were there. But all our flying almost was at night or all bad weather. At night or bad weather, we were the ones that were up there doing the patrol. Our total uh, uh, communications in, uh, that we had, we had one VHF radio with four channels on it. Total navigation gear we had, one ADM. And we thought that was an improvement because we didn't have to go out and listen to A's and N's and try to fly radio ranges. But we used to go over to the 
Well, then I eventually told my told my colleagues what I was doing, and let me tell you, there was no love lost, and that was the end of my ideas. <laughs> well, Walt's got a far better history than I do, but let me tell you, one of the first things that I encountered in going to pilot training was the great suspicion that pilots had of flight surgeons. Right. Because exactly. a flight surgeon can ground you with a stroke of a pen. And that is an incentive not to tell them anything. Never tell them anything. And, and it's amazing how fast that permeates the new pilots. Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to tell you, I can, I'll never forget this uh, flight surgeon well, when I was in the reserves at Los Alamitos. You have to take a flight physical once a year. In those days. It depends on what your rating is and all that stuff is today. But I had to take a flight physical once a year. And uh, there was a symbol of him had taken a flight physical with this new flight surgeon, and we've been kind of warned. I have the flattest feet in the world, and maybe even the uh, concave down there, the complex. And uh, I remember the first time I went into this flight surgeon, and I can remember squeezing the floor so hard with my toes and my heels so they had a little bit of, a, of an arch. <laughs> arch. And I catch this flight surgeon kind of looking out of the corner of his eyes like this, you know, to see if he'd catch it. Because I, I don't know, if they, do they feel particularly good because they could ground something or something? Anyhow, you get grounded in those days. And I thought, well, I'm an idiot. I'm never going to have to walk along with that. But anyhow, uh, that attitude is continued through, and I never forget just before the flight, I had something that uh, bothered me in the shoulder. And I was at dinner at a, with a guy, a, a, a doctor in Houston. And I can remember, he says, well, come in and see me. I never ever, to this day, have never reported to NASA that we took the x-rays. He said to three people around the country to see what they were. <laughs> and I, myself, I, I was thinking, well, maybe it's uh, cancer, but I'll be damned if I'm going to let them know I'm going to get that flight in before they find out. <laughs> so there is that kind of a natural distrust. To give you the end of the story about this flight surgeon, <coughs> I don't remember his name, didn't know a thing, but about, and that was back in 1960. Two or three, I don't remember which flight physical was. About three years ago, I get an email from a guy. And I didn't even know it. He sent a, a letter, an old fashioned letter. He said, found my address someplace. He sent me a letter. And he says, I'm Dr. So and so. <coughs> and uh, he says, I'm the one that signed your physical that allowed you to become an astronaut. This is the guy that was watching the the feet. And he says, I'm coming to town and I'm hoping we get together. He was taking credit for me becoming an astronaut because he had given me enough on the physical before I came down here. And he's the guy that we were scared to death of because he was trying to ground you for flat feet. He <laughs> <laughs> had a surprise ending. So. I'll tell you, and one thing that reinforced that, that barrier was that real or not, everyone you talked to had a horse for yeah. Related to what flight surgeons had done to them, or their friend, or a friend of a friend, and it just it perpetuates itself. Now I understand there's relationships between the national office and the medical people at Houston a little bit better than they were in our days. But boy, believe me, <coughs> you not just didn't talk about it. Talk about it. What's that? Not to hear the flight surgeons talk about it. I think it is a lot more open now, uh, and, and part of it is because they got they, they got a much, much more diverse. Uh, population yeah. of the people that's in there. There's still, back in my day it was 100% aviators. Today, it was 20 to 25% of them are, are aviators yeah. that are down there. So you've got most of that population is not all worried about you know, getting grounded excuse me, from these things. Uh, and NASA, in all honesty, I have to say, I think they did a hell of a job at uh, keeping us I really do. Yeah. But I will say I was sure sorry I didn't get to do my biofeedback experiment because I was sick to death for four days. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this whole, the guys are. <laughs> yeah. This whole uh, business, though, on the positive side of space adaptation is, is fascinating. I've spent a fair amount of time looking at myself. And uh, just to give you one example, uh, it, it's... it's uh, not everybody experiences it, but mo most people 
begin to lose bone mineral mass when you become weightless. <coughs> Uh, for some people, it's quite serious, and, go, and it goes at a pretty high rate. Others, it doesn't seem to happen at all. Uh, and I think we finally got an exercise machine up there on the space station. I talked to some people in Houston when I was down there for my last physical. Saw it demonstrated, and they're, they're pretty optimistic. They've had some people come back. Uh, Interesting. Zero, zero, yeah. zero change. So, so we probably are solving that problem through exercise. Uh, it, there may be some uh, pharmaceutical solutions as well, but uh, the exercise is obviously but the reason I bring this up is that the people, when the people come back, they gradually restore that bone mass, bone mineral mass. And the NIH, I've had some interactions with the NIH through the years, and, uh, and they're fascinated by this because that makes it different than the normal uh, aging process of losing bone mineral mass. And they want very much to know why did we recover our bone mineral mass when an older person doesn't. We don't know the answer to that question yet, but boy, that, I'll tell you, if we find that out, it can be very, very important as a, a, a prophylactic treatment for osteoporosis. That is also one of the beauties of studying uh, aerospace physiology in general. And normal anatomy and physiology, you learn about normal people in a normal environment. In medicine, you learn about sick people or diseased people in a normal environment. So you're going along some spectrum between normal and disease. In uh, aerospace physiology and medicine, you're looking at relatively normal people you choose. Uh, in a very <laughs> abnormal environment, and that's a completely different dimension of understanding how the human body works and responds to different situations. And so to me, that adds a depth of understanding that we will gradually accumulate with experience in space flight as well as in clinical medicine and in uh, experimental physiology and the like. So I think it's a very important addition to understanding things that will help people here on Earth with medicine. And that's past the spin-offs that you hear about that, that came out of the space program. It's just a better understanding of who we are as a, in, as individuals in a species <coughs> and how we respond. You know that you know they're doing a a, a life long study on all of this. Yes, I know. Yeah, I'm not sure it's a very good one. I'm not, I, I'm not sure. I think I would have looked at other things. Yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> I just got my last last episode last week. <laughs> We've got about 20 more minutes. I want to give uh, students, especially, a chance to ask some questions. So. Got a question for any of this. So, say for instance, giving your knowledge that you have right now, if you were able to turn back time to like one of us here and live in the modern day, would you choose to do this all over again? I would. Uh, that's a, that's that's a no question. No brainer. <laughs> Just making sure, yeah. <laughs> because you know there's. I'm, I'm, I was speaking to Dan here, and I'm just going through a, a decision process, per se. Uh, no, and no question about it. In fact, the older I get and the more times change, the more I realize how fortunate I was just to have lived when I did. Yeah. My background and what I did probably wouldn't get that job that I got back in 1960. But, but uh, you know, again, uh, there were some people not in my group, but in the next group of scientists, astronauts, engineer astronauts that were selected. A couple of people just decided it wasn't for them. Yeah. One did it in pilot training, another one after he got through pilot training and came to Houston. So, you know, people have to, you really have to evaluate your own motivations and what you, what you want to do. And uh, uh, it can happen. But boy, I'll tell you, I, uh, for me, it was. Uh, it was a series of, of accidental milestones that occurred <coughs> and that ended up where I and ended up in the, the national uh, But well, I think the one, the one thing that made the difference was that uh, it was education. You were broad enough to take advantage of these accidental milestones when they occurred with your education. And you could, you could jump in and, and do the next thing. 
the next career came along and you were prepared to take that one off. And when you talk about education, you know something? I can't re can't recall any more educational period of my life than the time I spent at Dassel. That's right. I got and something I forgot to say earlier when we were talking about flying, I wanted to mention to you. Uh, uh, those of you that are here learning to fly, <coughs> what kind of time do you have when you get finished? Just over 200 hours. Just over 200 hours. Very similar to military. I, I want to encourage you, even if you get your 200 hours, even if you get a commercial pilot, I would encourage any of you that have any interest in it to still go into the military. The military, fly. Uh, I cannot emphasize enough how, how much stronger really the military training was. Back in my day, uh, in the 50s and 60s, in that early flying time, the military training, Pensacola, they valued it at a million dollars. And that's not a uh, uh, number that's been escalated up to today. So I'm just saying, when you've got the government paying all those airplanes, all the performance, all that maintenance, placing all the demands on you, things that you will be fortunate if you get to learn uh, you know, formation flying, gunnery, or if you're in the Navy and landing on carry. There's so many skills that you can still get if you want to be a pilot. I wouldn't discourage any of you from going from here to here after you've gotten your, your commercial pilot so I wouldn't discourage you from going into Yeah, and let, 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 I, I totally agree with that. And let me emphasize one other thing. The personnel who were training us at Williams Air Force Base, who were part of what was called the Air Training Command, DC, were among the most professional individuals I have ever encountered. They were absolutely magnificent in how they conducted that training. And you would, if you followed that course, you would be tremendously impressed with how the quality of people Quite, a, quite an experience for me, I'll tell you. I never expected it when I showed up at the front gate there at Williams Air Force Base in Chandler. Uh, but they were really, I didn't know what to expect, but uh, I really, really impressed. Yeah, you need to respect for those dumb fighter jocks, right? Oh, yeah. I, did. <laughs> I, didn't know, I didn't know any fighter jocks before me. So. Really? <laughs> well, I met you. Well, yeah, but you were a student then. I was training him. <laughs> we were climbing up and down the side of Meteor Crater. <laughs> uh, another question? Um, <clears throat> obviously, it's probably scary at times knowing you're going to go into space. So, how did you um, deal with the fear leading up to um, going into space, essentially? Or, or was there any. I, I don't, I don't think that out. was, no, I don't think it ever appeared. And for me, it was because I had accomplished pilot training. I think pilot training was a, a major step that eliminated all that. We've talked about it earlier in the day. There's, if being a pilot, you develop that sense of responsibility, you gradually develop a feeling that you're competent enough to handle anything that comes along. And so what there's to be scared about. Now, other people say, well, you didn't understand the problem. <laughs> but uh, still, I don't know, it was, uh, and, and I think some of those people who have maybe opted out even after getting involved may have decided that they just they just had a fear that they didn't uh, want to uh, deal with. In fact, when I when we were in training in Cessna 172s, uh, there was one uh, uh, young man who uh, actually sold the 172. And then came to his instructor and said, I have to leave. I am not sleeping at night. I am scared to death every time I'm up there in that airplane. And he couldn't get over it. He was trying to get over it, but he yeah. couldn't get over it. Yeah. And that'll happen. Now, I, I have a feeling not, that's if that happened to any of your classmates, they're not here. Because you're already involved. You're in the, you're in the game. Uh, I don't, I don't remember <coughs> ever having one fearful thought about going into space. I don't know if that's a reflection on my IQ or not. <laughs> I do remember being afraid I might not get picked for safe things. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, if, if you're worried about dying, uh, yeah, 
Dr. Schmidt, if you put your uh, geologist hat on, when you were on physically on the moon, uh, what, uh, what surprised you most about lunar geology when you were on the surface? First of all, I had the benefit of knowing what three other crew, four, uh, five other crews had done and what they were able to do <coughs> and helped train most of them. Uh, and uh, that, uh, that gave me a lot of confidence that the environment would be such that you could get things accomplished. You could see things, you could move, maneuver, you could get around. And, uh, and so uh, I, I did, that did not surprise me that we were able to do as much as we did. Uh, it was sort of frustrating you couldn't do more because of the constraints of the suit and things like that. But, uh, but the visual involvement in environment, uh, the mobility environment for doing field geology was, was outstanding uh, compared, given the constraints that you had to operate with, uh, from a, uh, because that's out of most of the sensible atmosphere. And, uh, and the stars stop twinkling, and uh, you, uh, you see a very black sky, as long as the moon's not up, a very black sky and, and uh, just, uh, points of light. And as you approach sunrise in orbit, you get to see the zodiacal light, the, the uh, streamers coming out of the sun. They're just spectacular. Coming out of the, the moon acts as a culting disk uh, and, and allows you to look right up to sunrise see the, uh, these uh, uh, ejections, mass ejections, and other things that are coming out of the sun. Really, uh, I tell you, if you ever have a chance, I recommend going. <laughs> 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 You'll probably see a lot more than I saw. <laughs>